So uh, for the boring agenda, we still have three talk and uh, open discussion. But I will going to adjust the agenda a little bit because uh, we have some remote speakers in Germany, in Costa Rica, and uh, different time zones. So after your talk, and we will. Uh, the year is 2020. Well, after they have pre-recorded the video, so after their talk. And they will join us uh, remotely for live QA. So we will go to the uh, QA session directly at their talk. Okay. So uh, for next session's talk is about the uh, digital infrastructures. And there are two presenters uh, based in Germany, and they found a co-founder of Superbird Lab, uh, Elisa and Julia. And I'm going to give us a short, uh, about 12 minutes uh, video uh, to address about a research project about uh, the FOS communities, some research that we've done in this year. So we can have a look uh, about the video and we have slide for the sections. So if you have any question, want to rise and you can what's the call of this session slide -off? presenter and Elisa and she is a chain that at register and she do a lot of uh, intersexual uh, research on technology and social science. So uh, I encourage you to have a look about their website uh, Superb Dev and there's a lot of uh, research going on a very interesting project. And Julia and she's work uh, mostly in technology field and she's a co-founder of Holder for Germany, and she uh, tried to grow the uh, civil tech communities in Germany. So it's the call for Slido, and if you have any question, and we can encourage you to use this app to raise your question. Okay, so we can have a look about the video and have some Q&A sessions immediately after this.
motivates them and push them to see things. Because I'm happy to talk to different projects, small projects, large projects, international ones, and local ones. And then we wrapped up all our findings in a neat report that you can read here. But today we want to pick up every tales from our research and we want to share them with you. And perhaps like the storytellers of old, we might have exaggerated a little bit here and there, so do take them with a pinch of salt. Here are our four most favorite tales that are not about goals and Romans, but about our digital infrastructure behind them. Tale number one, how to become a Catholic warrior, aka open source developer. We talked to people how they became part of the open source community and part of the project, and their stories were always the same. They said they spent a long time reading mailing lists. They spent a long time trying to make sense of the code, and only then took part in discussions and eventually commit the code. Clear onboarding mechanisms are the exception, not the rule. Here are a few quotes that came up in our interviews, and I'm sure you've heard similar things before when you were involved in the infrastructure project. We expect newcomers to know that. Thank you. 
supply and freedom of mobility. So while there's no simple solution to this issue, one solution would be to find the middle ground. The middle ground between really rigid structures and anarchy. Not only for the sake of money, but also for the sake of new people who join open source projects, because a certain kind of structure helps them to navigate the projects better and also helps them to get into the decision-making processes. So also what's their opinions in these processes. Tale number four, the broken step. The internet is what it is. It's a network that was never designed to transport everyone's everyday conversations and transactions and data. But this is exactly what it does today. And many of the technologies and the foundations of the internet do not take these very basic requirements into account that we need to make the internet just work in place, like privacy, safety, or like identification. And this means that projects want to create good things, need to find hot fixes and workarounds to uphold these values like privacy and safety. And at the same time, they have the foundations of the internet constantly working against these goals. One of our interview partners referred to this daily struggle in their work as the broken stack. And they meant broken not in a way that it's against productivity or efficiency, but that it works against security and privacy. And I believe that this is something that we really have to talk about on a global scale to make an internet that actually works. We believe that this is the real challenge that we need to overcome if we want to end the occupation of the internet to speak in asterisk terms here. We need to rethink the very foundations. We need to rethink those foundations with human rights and human dignity in mind. And recreate the foundations in a way that makes the internet a better, a safer, and also more joyful place. The infrastructure communities we talk to have some ideas around how this could be done. And while to feature all these ideas we totally exceed the limit um, of the amount of time we have for this talk, I want to highlight the work that the Human Rights Research Group, a working group of the Internet Research Task Force has been doing. Beatrice Martini, Neil Stan Uber, and many others have been doing interesting work around this. And I would uh, recommend you to check out some of their work. But what I think is also very crucial to keep in mind is that it takes the support, the skills, and the knowledge of every single one of us who's part of these communities and these networks in order to make the internet a place that is safe and that respects human rights. So, uh, Julia and Elsa and they are joining us uh, in Germany. The year is 2000. It's uh, about half past three in very early morning in Germany, so we have better to uh, take this advantage for the uh, time to do any QA, QA uh, any question. Can we switch to Slido in case someone would like to use Slido to? Hi everyone, by the way. Um, no question? No, I just wanted to say hi. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, in case. Okay to, I yeah. It was okay to, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, uh, um, uh, so perhaps I can write the first question and to. Uh, how to others follow me. So uh, my question is, because I, I noticed that uh, your research is funded by Ford Foundations and Salon Foundation. So I'm kind of curious about uh, this kind of traditional foundation layer attitude on this kind of uh, implicit or very invisible uh, support for this research. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Right. Could, sorry, could you repeat that? The yeah, because, uh, yeah. Yeah, because uh, your research was founded by broad foundations. Um, I'm kind of curious about this kind of traditional foundation layer attitude to support this kind of implicit of 
basic research on this regard. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, in our experience, um, there are not many foundations out there um, that support research on, on tech issues, and especially not on open source. Um, they mostly would focus on innovation, and I think the Ford Foundation and Sloan Foundation are one of a few really good examples of foundations, like what kind of impact they can achieve if they support research or even development, and it doesn't even be better, right? Uh, in the FOSS infrastructure sector and the FOSS sector in general. Um, yeah, so I can just tell every other foundation that is listening do the same and uh, support those people who, who basically do not need it. Julie, do you want to add something? round of research coming up actually, so um, we were part of the first round of this research and next year there's going to be a second round and uh, all the other research reports are on the Ford Foundation's website and there is also a pretty cool book by Nadia Ekbal called uh, The Making and Maintenance of Open Source Software uh, but I highly recommend it because um, it deep dives into some things that we just briefly talked about in our video and I hope it was okay to send the video because it's very early um, so in, here in Germany so we figured uh, it'd be better to, to pre-report something. Hi. Yeah, so I encourage you guys to have a look about uh, their research, a uh, long work ahead. And it's very, very concise and very well edited uh, uh, report and they have some very insightful and some challenges faced by open source communities and infrastructure developers in general. Any comment or feedback or any persons who work on this kind of infrastructure developers and would like to share your uh, insight or feedback on this regard. Yeah, because uh, infrastructure usually is very invisible because we can use a pre app applications, but uh, we didn't uh, sense about the importance of you know, cold, uh, cold water, electricity, all the kind of hardware infrastructure and software infrastructure. So it's very, very important issues. And we have a, a follow from. Hello, I'm Mark from uh, from the Netherlands, actually, with a bit of a um, Do you feel that, um, well, big tech is getting bigger and bigger, um, but do you feel that uh, the public opinion is changing and there's more interest in grassroots infrastructure organizations the last couple of years uh, because of criticism of the big tech and stuff like that? You may ask, Tarad, would you be careful to jump in any time? Um, I think we're at a crucial point right now because due to the pandemic, I think many countries in the world have faced kind of a digital shift or um, an acceleration of the digital transformation that has been going on for decades, basically. Um, and at least in general, we had huge discussions about whether people can use Zoom or Cisco or what the right platform is. There were many schools that switched to open source, um, others that switched to Microsoft and were heavily criticized. So I'm not sure whether we have like passed the peak of the mountain yet and everyone is full on board of open source. Um, but I feel that open source has somehow become more widely known as a concept that is worth yeah, fighting for. Um, that would be my, my perspective on this. Yeah, invitations also, but I see this talking digital sovereignty. So, what digital technologies do we need to in order to yeah, um, flourish in our uh, free and open societies? And I think this is a very interesting topic where, of course, I mean, the public infrastructure uh, plays a crucial role. And we can see in some policy papers that just came out 
that um, yeah, politicians that the government is focusing and has a, a strong focus on public digital infrastructure. And I think now is the point that also civil society um, um, comes with suggestions, uh, shows what they have been building, what infrastructure they have been building in the past couple of years. Because what we also saw during the schools didn't know what software to use, that um, yeah, civil society organizations who were developing software um, supported schools and provided them with free, secure, and open source uh, software for video conferencing, for example. And this is just one example of our access to Wi-Fi and that art communities, not only China, across the world, but have been around for many years. And I think now is the time where um, to showcase this work and um, yeah, what has been built uh, in, the, in the past couple of years and where um, not only foundations but also governments can support these movements, uh, can help them to um, step up their game and also collaborate with them. And uh, thanks for the question, Mark. Yeah, great question. Um, and, and I think it's it's a global issue and I think we see that in so many places. Um, I know that what the Club Zero community is doing at that account, as uh, Julia said in the talk, is a great example that other communities should follow. And maybe we just need to tell these stories more loudly that it is important to have more skills and also address that if you are just talking about coding only people who code will join your project. Yeah. So um, where do you find the people that have non-coding skills and um, also maybe come from different yeah. backgrounds and have to learn or um, expand on their coding skills first before they can actively join? And I think we will see as developers seem to go out of their comfort zone. And I guess it would help to start with basic community management, where there is a, a person who is approachable, um, people know that they can send them an email or I don't know what, a message um, or whatever channel um, to ask questions so that they don't feel they are these moves um, will get laughed at if they ask questions that are perceived as stupid. So I think community management is key. And also to and also to explicitly invite people to to review where are gaps, um, what skills are lacking, what backgrounds are lacking, and to then make it very explicit when you're um, uh, um, in your calls for participation. I think another thing that we've seen in communities uh, that have been working with is um, promoting diverse people into leadership positions. Um, so once you have, um, yeah, once the leadership teams are more diverse, um, that draws uh, people in, the people from like similar backgrounds. So it's not only about involving people in the community, but also if there's a, a some positions. I know many many communities are also um, not super top down hierarchy. If there is um, leadership or opportunity to give people a platform and to put them in the spotlight, then to um, make sure that it's not always the usual suspects, but um, to focus on folks who are not um, that much represented in, in, in the communities. Thank you. 
people share your experience with us. No further question. Otherwise, I'm going to end this session. Thank you, Elsa and 
Julia and for your second fly of your Philippines to stay late with us. So just give a big hand for both of them. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. 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 Thank you.